to the extent that it almost got very close to complete digital collapse. You know, the level of cyber attack, sort of three weeks of continuous attack, continuous denial of service, continuous hacking on a scale that just hadn't been seen anywhere before. Um, you know, parliament, banks, ministries, newspapers, broadcasters, you know, te uh, telecoms exchanges, just pounding away at every aspect of it with people having to close things down, shut things off, disconnect things, fight viruses uh, and so forth. And it was all triggered by uh, a decision by the, uh, uh, the Estonian government of the time uh, who wanted to relocate a bronze statue um, that was uh, set up to commemorate uh, um, uh, some Soviet activity uh, in years gone by and they decided they wanted to relocate it uh, somewhere else and they wanted to relocate the remains of the Soviet soldiers who were buried with it as well and that became a huge sort of issue and so forth and then all of a sudden this massive sophisticated orchestrated wave of attacks uh, hit the country and almost brought it to its uh, its digital uh, knees and that triggered planners military planners around the world to really wake up to the fact that in this day and age you know th this is another type of attack you know is you can you can be attacked on that scale and our, our societies now are so connected you know imagine if the UK or any other country was subject to that sort of sustained attack on that sort of scale so it really sort of woke military planners up to that and people really started to focus on it and then again in the uh, when Georgia and South Ossetia and Russia got into a battle in 2008 um, about the disputed uh, lands of South Ossetia, uh, there was a whole wave of attacks that hit, uh, hit Georgia as well. Uh, you know, the, people talk about it, they talk about the first wave being very, very synchronized uh, and uh, very specialist and coordinated that sort of knocked out various things and then the second wave that came was almost like a cyber riot it was almost as if every hacker in the world sort of thought wow the, the doors have been you know bust wide open the windows are open let's just go in and raid everywhere and so forth so you sort of got a what appeared to be quite a coordinated thing followed by what appeared to be a sort of mass uh, cyber riot and you know this really sort of woke you know th these sorts of activities really woke companies uh, countries up uh, to the challenges that they face. There's also things like, uh, you know, the US uh, will, will talk about Titan Rain. Since 2003, you know, all sorts of US government agencies and uh, companies and major defense companies have sort of been continuously being probed and, and prodded just on a, on a, a huge scale. So, you know, Com countries are starting to spend serious money to beef up their cyber defenses and also to beef up their cyber offenses as well. They want to be able to uh, hit back if somebody attacks them. They also want to be able to defend themselves. The UK uh, is spending something like 650 million pounds over four years, so sort of 150 and 180 million a year uh, on cyber security. The US uh, is declared to, to be spending of the order of three billion dollars a year, three billion dollars a year on cyber security. You know, imagine what you can do uh, with with that sort of money. You know, let alone what you know, country after country. You know, how much is China, Russia, you know, every single country uh, spending? And they use them for defensive and uh, and offensive uh, purposes as well. Um, you know, people have started to uh, allegedly uh, you know uh, deploy very targeted worms. There's a, there was a, a type of worm uh, called a Stutnex uh, worm that, was, that seemed to go after a particular type of equipment. It would spread from computer to computer, but it would only activate and start doing its dirty work if it found certain types of computers. Otherwise, it would leave them alone. And what it ended up doing was almost grinding to a halt um, uh, you know, Iran's uh, nuclear uh, um, uh, processing uh, uh, capability. So everyone's scratching their heads saying, hmm, I wonder who would have released a, uh, a worm that would, <laughs> that would do that then. Um, and you know, people will be researching these things uh, all the time. They're, you know, 20 plus countries uh, that are known to have cybersecurity programs. Uh, when I worked with the, uh, did a bit of work with the UN and uh, the International Telecoms Union in Geneva uh, on this sort of issue, there were a lot of countries uh, in the room really getting themselves up to speed uh, on what they needed to uh, what they needed to do and clearly 
every terrorist organization worth its salt will be uh, seeing what it can do as well. Every criminal network worth its salt will be doing the same thing. You know, if you're a, uh, a South American uh, drugs cartel, you know, why aren't you going to be employing hackers and fraudsters and so forth in order to try and find out what's going on and what your opponents are going to be doing next and what the authorities are going to be doing next? Uh, if you're a terrorist organization, you know, why aren't you going to be thinking to yourself, oh, I wonder if we can penetrate this bank or this organization? organization uh, and so forth. It's, it's going on uh, and they overlap with each other. So if you're a country and you're going to try and organize a denial of service attack, i.e. where you get millions of computers in order to bombard one of your enemies at the same time, where are you going to get millions of computers from? Well, perhaps you go and rent some time from the botnet guys. Yeah, that would be a way to do it. Um, or perhaps you just go and lean on them and say, look, we're going to close you down unless you do this for us. Um, botnet guys and those sorts of guys tend to be quite smart. They tend not to attack the people uh, in the countries that they're in. They'll, they'll tend to leave everyone alone and they'll attack other people uh, instead. Um, so. This is, uh, this is the world that we, uh, we live in now. Um, and I think in a way the challenge for us, yeah, the, the, cyber, uh, the Cybermen are coming. They're, not, they're relentless. They will keep coming. Uh, in five years' time, there'll be more of them. They'll be smarter. Um, we will be fighting harder to defend ourselves against them. I think the challenge for the likes of University of Wol Wolverhampton is to say, what can we do? How can we organize ourselves? How can we research this area in niches that we have expertise? There are lots of people researching this area in different places all over the world. Well, you know, the way to have an impact, and the great thing about this area is you'll never be out of a job. <laughs> Recession or no, you know, these, the Cybermen aren't going to give up. So if you do this for a living, you will, you will work forever, basically. The amounts of money going into this area um, will just uh, keep you employed. And the research that needs to be done doesn't stop as well. This isn't like the sort of thing where in a few years' time we figured it all out, we've solved all the problems, job done. It will keep changing, it will keep evolving, people, you know, new devices come along, you know, people try and hack new things, it will just keep on going. So my view is that the Cybermen are attacking us in all their forms. They will continue to do so. They're cold, they're calculating, they are very, very smart, they are completely unfeeling, they are completely relentless. Uh, it's about money, it's about disrupting opponents, it's about causing trouble. Um, I can't hide behind the sofa anymore. I'm quite scared of them, but I can't hide behind the sofa. Uh, we've got to come out, we've got to take them on, uh, we've got to use our expertise uh, in order to keep fighting that battle. Thank you very much.